Thank you. Mm. Let me start with a quote from Friedrich Engels, written in February 1849 in a newspaper he edited together with his partner mm, Karl Marx. And written around one year after those two published their Communist Manifesto. Marx, and I quote, the next world war will not only cause reactionary classes and dynasties to disappear from the face of the earth, but also entire reactionary peoples. And that too is an advance. Uh, the quote is even more expressive in his native German. I'll quote him in German too. Der nächste Weltkrieg wird nicht nur reaktionäre Klassen und Dynastien, er wird auch ganze reaktionäre Völker vom Erdboden verschwinden machen. Und das ist auch ein Fortschritt. Well, what is this? It sounds like he is advocating genocide on some unnamed peoples. Well, is this really an appeal for genocide? Is this maybe a key to the genocidal thought of the 20th century? Or is it maybe only uh, an unimportant parenthetic episode in the history of Marxist thought. At the very least, we can say that uh, this quote and several similar quotes, which I will get back to, are indeed deeply uncomfortable and embarrassing for Marxists and Marxist-leaning scholars. Uh, let me explore this a bit further. Engels had this theory about some nations, some peoples in Europe. And uh, then we are speaking about uh, Slav nations, like the Croats, Slovenians, the Ruthenian Ukrainians, like the Czechs and the Slovaks, all those Slavic people living as part of the great Habsburg Empire. But also, Peoples like, uh, well, the Celts, Gaelic people in Scotland, like the Bretons in France, like the Basques in Spain, etc. All these peoples, they were, in Engels' view, non-historic peoples. He says that, I quote again, there is no country in Europe that does not possess in some remote corner at least one remnant people. And these remnants of a nation, as he calls them, they are or they will be mercilessly crushed, as Hegel said, by the course of history. All these small nations, they had, according to Engels, no state traditions, no elite culture. They were merely barbaric peasants. They had no potential for state formation. They were unfit for the modern world. And they were doomed. The forces of history would crush them. In contrast to these non-historic peoples, Engels wrote about uh, what he called the great historic nations of Europe, 
like the Germans, Italians, the Hungarians, and the Poles, and all of these nations, well, they deserved their own state. They um, had historical state traditions. They had their own elites in a social sense. They had their own high culture and so on. Well, uh, this idea, this theory about doomed non-historic nations and great historic nations. Well, Engels had it mainly from the German philosopher Hegel. And it's uh, important to notice that uh, Marx was in full agreement with Engels in this regard. They edited, published this newspaper, Neue Rheinische Zeitung, together in 1848, 1849. And both in their writings there and elsewhere, they had this division of labor. So, well, Marx let Engels write principally about uh, history, nationalism, nations, and so on. In 1851 and 52, Marx published a series of articles written for a newspaper in the US. Uh, these articles were collected in a book called The Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Germany. It was published in Marx's name, but it was mainly ghost written by Engels. And in these articles, this theory about uh, non-historic and historic nations is repeated. Uh, and these nations, these small, doomed, non-historic nations, they were not only non-historic. They were also, according to Marx and Engels, reactionary or counter-revolutionary in a political and historical sense. Their extinction was also necessary and uh, progress. So, on the one hand, this theory, well, it's not representative of Marxist thought in a strict ideological sense. Especially the theory of social classes, class struggle is completely absent. Here they only have these nations, revolutionary and counter-revolutionary nations, and not social classes inside the national communities. And as uh, some communist critics have pointed out several times, also to me, both Marx and Engels said some nice things about uh, lots of small nations in other contexts. But on the other hand, those founding fathers of Marxism retracted anything ever, as far as I know, uh, of this theory. And some later utterings, especially from Engels, confirms, in a broad sense, the theory. For instance, uh, there are some very uh, unpleasant, if you like, utterings concerning the Norwegian and Swedish uh, Laponians uh, in 1866, a uh, letter from Engels to a British newspaper. Uh, if we take a broader look at this theory and its place in the thought of Marx and Engels, well, what we can call the mindset of Marx and Engels, what can we deduce then? Well, 
Marx and Engels, they claim moral and scientific high ground in their arguments. They claim that they had found the one single truth about history, society, and mankind. And from this self-declared elevated position, they could at least rhetorically sentence whole peoples, ethnic communities, whole groups to life or extinction. In a scientific sense, yeah, they claim they had discovered the big forces of history. And in a moral sense, they claimed they had found the absolute end of human history, the classless society, the communist society. This end, this goal for humankind, was in their thought so absolute, so glorious, and so necessary for the human race that all sorts of means were allowed to reach it. They had no regards at all for human life. For one life, or a few hundred, or a few thousand lives, or for maybe even bigger numbers of lives. In a broader sense, it's also interesting to look at the argument Engels made in the same period concerning uh, some other nations, namely the Germans and the Danes and more generally the Nordic nation. Well, to cut a long story short, Marx and Engels supported Prussia and the German states in the war against Denmark in 1848. And Engels wrote that this war was a war between the German civilization and Danish Scandinavian barbarism. A war of progress against static stability. Uh, he also wrote that, uh, well, compared to the civilized Germans, the Danes, and the Swedes in Scandinavia, were barbaric. And he wrote that, uh, well, the Norwegians were even more barbaric and most barbaric of the Scandinavian peoples. You can guess who that might be. Well, that was the Icelandic nation. Uh, Engels also wrote in this regard that uh, this um, perspective on the war, Germany versus Denmark, this war between the civilized Germany and the barbaric Danes. Well, in this war, Germany had the right, as he said it, the right of civilization against barbarism. Even if the treaties were in Denmark's favor, he wrote, which is very doubtful, he added, this right carries more weight than all the treaties. For it is the right of historical evolution. So the right of historical evolution, as discovered and interpreted by Marx and Engels, trumps all sorts of treaties. Uh, I may also add that uh, Marx and Engels, uh, even with positions like this, didn't consider themselves as German chauvinists. For them, 
the revolutionary struggle was the main deciding goal and the main deciding factor in history. And Germany was on the side of the revolution in 1848. Uh, Engels, um, an older, rather violent and blob thirsty quote, wrote that it was necessary to fight a life and death struggle with the Slav Dom, which uh, has betrayed the revolution. A war of uh, annihilation and ruthless terrorism, as he expressed it, not in the interests of Germany, but in the interests of the revolution. So these interests of the revolution, as discovered and interpreted by Marx and Engels, well, those interests trump everything else. This is uh, indeed what we may call a sacralization of politics. But was he actually advocating genocide? Well, uh, the language could be very violent and bloodthirsty indeed. As I just said, well, he uh, wanted a war of uh, extermination. Okay, he called for, in German, it's, it has a bit more punch in German, Vernichtungskampf und rücksichtslosen Terrorismus. This, this war against the reactionary Slavdom. He wrote that we can only secure the revolution against these Slav peoples by the most decisive acts of terrorism. And he wrote that the coming general war would exterminate all these small pig-headed nations even to their very names. In German, alle diese kleinen stierköpfigen Nationen bis auf ihren Namen vernichten. Well, this language is, um, especially in German, perhaps deeply uncomfortable, of course. Uh, the Ukrainian Marxist Roman Rostovsky, a critical Marxist, living in exile in the United States after World War II, actually wrote and published a book-length study on this topic, Marx and Engels and the Nationale Frage, as it was called in German. And Rostovsky is very, very critical of Marx and especially uh, Engels, but still stops when it comes to discussing was this really a call for genocide. According to Rostovsky's interpretation, well, it was only meant as extermination in a cultural sense. A total assimilation of the unhistoric, non-historical nations into the historical nations like the Germans. If necessary, and most probably by force. And he adds that, well, this is, of course, uh, bad enough as it is. But this interpretation, well, to put it this way, is very generous and kind to Engels and his partner, Marx. Another interpretation, we find several places, most interestingly, perhaps, um, at the old German Marxist Karl Kautsky, which shortly before his death wrote that, well, Engels indeed 
wanted to exterminate those Slav and other non-historic peoples in a physical sense. And this interpretation we have, may also find several places at what we can call anti-Marxist writers. For instance, uh, the British uh, literature historian George Watson, who has written that uh, this is the doctrine of Marxist genocide in its original form, and further on, that Auschwitz was socialist inspired, and that Engels wanted whole races, uh, wanted them to have to be exterminated. Also, in interpretations like the exiled Russian journal Continent in the 1970s, 1976, if I remember correctly, taunted Marxists in Russia and elsewhere with the polemical point that well, Engels preceded Hitler. Engels and his genocidal views was the forerunner for Hitler's genocide. So, well, I would say that, on the one hand, uh, Ostolsky is too generous, too kind. He doesn't give any argument for his uh, generous cultural-only <laughs> interpretation. But on the other hand, anti-Marxist critics like George Watson, well, they tend to overstate their case somewhat also. If you ask me, my interpretation would be that, well, this was not an either-or question for Marx and Engels. Of course, those two ideologues, Marx and Engels, well, they could have developed this theory and they could have added uh, some sort of uh, well, humanitarian approach to it. They could have said that, well, those nations, they are doomed by history and this is unfortunate, of course, in some ways, and they could have expressed some sympathy for the plight of the poor Croat or Slovenian peasant, for instance. But they didn't. They didn't do that at all. On the other hand, they, and especially Engels, stressed the role of force in this matter. A very striking quote from Engels is this. Nothing is accomplished in history without force and pitiless ruthlessness. I also would point to what I would consider a key phrase when we are to interpret this theory and its relationship with modern genocidal thought. Engels wrote, as I already have quoted, that uh, these rem remnants of a nation they would be mercilessly crushed by the course of history. Uh, they are always the fanatical representative of the counter-revolution. And, he says, remains so until it is completely exterminated or denationalized, as its whole existence is in itself a protest against a great historical revolution. Well, this is an approach that basically says, well, he doesn't really care what would happen to those peasants in Croatia and Slovenia and other doomed non-historic nations. They, uh, well, may be 
totally assimilated into the great historical nations. So their uh, national characteristics will disappear that way. Or they may be exterminated in a physical sense. Basically, my interpretation is this. Well, Engels didn't care. The main point was that they disappeared from the face of the Earth. Uh, not in the interests of German nationalism or something like that, but in the interests of the revolution, of the communist great absolute end. Uh, yeah, I will um, conclude these remarks with some more musings of the legacy in the Marxist tradition for this theory. As I said, uh, of course, in some ways, this is a very embarrassing episode in Marxist thought. And it's difficult today to argue that Engels was right in claiming that uh, peoples like the Czechs or the Croats were unable to create their own states. Uh, also in a more uh, subtle, subtle sense, uh, well, this is embarrassing because the class struggle, well, it doesn't really fit in those theories about uh, doomed non-historical nations. But Marxists, well, they have tried to cope anyway. Not everyone has coped as this uh, very critical and serious Marxist Rostolsky. A more usual approach has been to forget about the whole thing and not mention it. If it has been mentioned, well, the interpretation uh, has tended to be like uh, the German Marxist and friend of Marx and Engels, Franz Mehring, in 1902, when he wrote, and I quote, Engels was wrong when he denied an historical future to the smaller Slav nations, but the fundamental idea which governed his attitude was undoubtedly correct. We find similar tones another place in the history of Marxist ideas, namely in the famous series of lectures given by Joseph Stalin in 1924, collected in a book called The Foundations of Leninism. And here Stalin writes, and I quote, in the 40s of the last century, Marx supported the national movement of the Poles and Hungarians and was opposed to the national movement of the Czechs and the South Slavs. Why? Because the Czechs and the South Slavs were then reactionary peoples. End of quote. This is the official Bolshevik party line. Well, they were fundamentally correct then in the 1840s. But uh, history has changed, and the world has changed, and well, this is not strictly correct now. And then we go on and forget about the things that doesn't quite fit. Of course, Stalin's actions, they speak much louder than his words in this regard. And uh, few people nowadays would argue that we don't find a genocidal approach in Stalin's political actions. As we find it in Mao Zedong's 
Chinese politics in Pol Pot, Cambodia, and so on. Uh, I think it's interesting to notice that on an abstract level, the fundamentals that uh, Merlin said uh, were right and in order by Engels and Marx, well, they are simply this. They have the moral and the scientific high ground. They have the right to decide who are to live and who are to die, not in the course of some chauvinist or other fashion, but in the course of the revolution. If we define genocide as killing by category, yeah, we'll find genocidal thought in droves, of course, in the communist legacy. And in this theoretical abstract sense, I would say, well, at least the church fathers, Marx and Engels, they came very close to this genocidal approach in the writings about non-historic peoples around 18. 50. They were, in this unfortunate sense, pioneers in this field. Thank you. <laughs>